Hi everybody, it's Wednesday the 28th of June. Appreciate you dropping in for another TNT as we catch up with some local and regional news. Now, uh, some sad news to start with. Just bear with me. A Glastonbury man dies after medical incident at festival site. This reported in the BBC. And the story says uh, a man in his 40s has died at Glastonbury Festival following a medical incident. And the man died at the scene despite the efforts of emergency services. His next of kin have been informed. Now, as it happens, uh, I knew that person and he was also very, very well known, particularly in Phuket. So if you just indulge me for a moment, I'd just like to celebrate the life of Jason Wilder. Jason was just a complete force of nature. Unfortunately, he only got to 48 years, but let me tell you, he packed more into those 48 years than all of us would ever pack into an entire life. Mostly I worked with Jason at Live 89.5, the radio station, when I first came to Phuket. I was his work compatriot, uh, at some stage his boss and a good friend. And we used to go out and socialise from time to time. But when it came to socialising, Jason was way ahead of me, way in front of all of us. And uh, he could party on like, like nobody I knew. He spoke his sort of own version of Thai. But uh, he, he had a lot of Thai friends, probably more Thai friends than expats, and they loved him. And everywhere that Jason would go, he was the, the most engaging and embracing personality that I could know. When he was on, he was very hard to turn him off. Jason was the afternoon drive time announcer on Live 89.5 for, I don't know, maybe 12 or 14 years. I'd have to dig back into the archives to, to work out the exact date he started, which was before I arrived on the island. But uh, he always opened his program with, Sawadika, Pinon Krap, and that was his, uh, his call sign every time he started his program. But for three hours every day, he was engaging, he was entertaining, he was spontaneous, he was completely unpredictable, and he was the funniest person I can ever remember. And he really loved his music. He was always complaining about the, the song lists, uh, the playlists on the radio station, always slipping in a few songs or maybe deleting a few he didn't like. But his love of music was always at the forefront. Uh, he was quite a gifted musician and he always loved Glastonbury. He always talked about Glastonbury. And I'm sure the reason he moved back to the UK and stayed there after uh, the COVID pandemic is because he just wanted to be around the people, the friends, and the whole vibe of uh, Glastonbury. So rest in peace, Jason Wilder. What a tour de force. What a force of nature. What a wonderful person. And a sad loss. Jason Wilder, dead at 48 years old. Moving on with some other stories today on TNT. And I was looking for one particular story, but as I was going through the Castle English Facebook page, I came across a few other things I thought I should just mention. This uh, from Associated Press, apparently. A Thai court is to deliver a verdict today in the case of five people accused of impeding the Queen's motorcade during a pro-democracy march in 2020, an offence that, if judged egregious, could bring a death sentence. Well, th that's not going to happen, but these people could be sentenced. And uh, this was during the, the height of the protests back in 2020. And it's not as if these people were necessarily trying to impede the progress of a royal motorcade. It was just that the royal motorcade and a place where the protests were happening just uh, sort of got in the way of each other. Uh, bad planning by a few people, I would suggest, but we'll be interested to see what happens with the outcome of that case. And also this one, also reported on the Cowshot English Facebook page, two activists were sentenced yesterday by the criminal court to two years and eight months each for insulting the monarchy at a rally in December 2020, and they're appealing and were granted bail, again at the height of the protests. And part of the, the protests were about calling for changes to the constitution in Thailand, the 2017 constitution, and they were wanting changes changes to the, the constitutional role of the head of state of Thailand. But that was seen, obviously, by some to be an insult 
to His Majesty and to the role of the monarch. And so, again, we'll wait to hear what happens with those appeals. But this is the story I was actually looking for. And it says the U.S. ambassador to Thailand, Robert Godek, held a press conference yesterday reiterating that the U.S. doesn't interfere in Thai politics. And it says persistent rumours have spread the U.S. is supporting and manipulating the Move Forward Party. However, Godek called the rumour dangerous and false. Now, these rumours have popped up in our comments section on TNT as well. Most of them I just delete because they are complete fabrications and with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. BangkokPost.com reports the ambassador denies US conspired with any political party. The United States ambassador to Thailand has denied the US conspired with any particular political party or interfered in the May 14 general election. And the ambassador said yesterday the US was ready to work with all Thai political parties. He was responding to allegations made by conservative groups that Washington was involved in a political conspiracy to interfere in the general election. And asked about the controversial plan to amend Section 112 of the Criminal Code, that's the Les Majeste Law, which is about insulting the head of state of Thailand, he said that was an internal affair of Thailand and the US government always respected Thailand's highest institution. And that, as far as I can see throughout uh, the history I know of Thailand, has always been part of the relationship between the United States and Thailand. And further down there, the ambassador also denied claims made by prominent conservative figures that the US planned a military base in Thailand or was negotiating with any party in the country. So the US ambassador to Thailand having to take time out of his day to deny those rumours, uh, let's hope that people can either come up with evidence that that was ever the case or just shut up and move on. Let's move on to our next story today and from nationthailand.com Japanese account for 70% of total investments in Thai industrial estates and the Industrial Estate Authority of Thailand is actively encouraging the electronics and steel industries to focus on manufacturing products that utilize advanced technologies and innovations collaborating with Japanese expertise. A lot of Japanese companies of course operating here in Thailand and uh, as usual, we always try and remind people that the Japanese are the most numerous expats here in Thailand. The IEAT governor revealed that a delegation of developers from 10 industrial estates had participated in an investment promotion roadshow in Nakhon Ratchasima province, which has industrial potential and ranks third in Japan's economic cities. Well, that's a surprise. Number three... For Japanese economic cities. Well, that's the statement made in nationthailand.com and they said that Japanese investors still rank first in terms of investment in industrial estates with a total of nearly 2,000 investors and a combined investment value of 3.1 trillion baht and this constitutes more than 70% of the total investment value of 12 trillion baht and a significant portion of their investments is located within the Eastern Economic Corridor. Noting that uh, Nekon Ratchasima is more northeast rather than part of the Eastern Economic Corridor, but it looks like the Japanese continue their large investments here in Thailand. Moving to our next story now, and ChannelNewsAsia.com opining that Thailand's military machinations will define post-election political manoeuvring. I'll put a link in the description of this video if you'd like to read this article in full, but I thought I'd just pull out a few salient paragraphs that uh, might be interesting. And it says that uh, over a month after Thailand's progressive Move Forward Party and its prime ministerial candidate, Pita Lim Jolunrat, won a decisive victory in the country's general election, a minefield of legal, political and military obstacles is hindering his ascension to prime minister. Well, yes, here we are a month and a half after the election and we're really no closer to forming a government here in Thailand. If you're looking from outside, it probably looks ridiculous. But the Move Forward Party led eight party, 312 member coalition in waiting, which includes Per Thai, still needs 64 out of the 250 member junta appointed Senate 
to achieve the constitutionally mandated 376 seats to form a government. That magic 376 number is a majority if the two houses sit with uh, some 750 members. Halve that, you get 375, and you'll need one more, giving you 376 to get a Prime Minister appointed. Even before parliamentary approval, move forward and per time remain at loggerheads over which of them will fill the slot of the lower house speaker. Since only a speaker can nominate a prime minister, their failure to agree could prevent any from being selected. Yeah, this has been quite a sideshow. More about that in a moment. But uh, the article says, in fact, Pertai would clearly like to dump move forward so that it can lead a coalition of its own. The Speaker squabble provides a convenient issue for doing so, though cabinet allocation disagreements or an election commission verdict against Peter could also do the trick. And it goes on with this theory, saying that rumours have spread about secret negotiations to form an alternative coalition between Per Tai, Pumjai Tai and the Democrats. Per Tai's publicly refused to form a government with Prayut Chanocha's 36-seat United Thai Nation Party or the Palang Pracharat Party because of their role in the 2014 coup. So Per Tai, Pumjai Tai and the Democrats together in a coalition. Well, that is certainly one of the many alternatives. Uh, whether Per Tai is actively plotting against Move Forward, uh, well, I think that's more of a theory than a fact. Let's go on and read a few more stories about this. NationThailand.com saying that Move Forward threatens to leave the coalition if it's denied the House Speaker post. And the Move Forward party's made a proposition that Per Tai cannot afford to refuse. Give us the House Speaker's seat or we'll cancel the coalition and become the opposition. Now, arguably, Move Forward Party could do a lot more in opposition, or certainly a lot more damage, uh, to Per Tai than working with them in a leading coalition. Move Forward has the largest number of MPs at 151, and if Per Tai fails to make a deal with it, it we'll have to form a coalition with parties that were part of the outgoing government. Hence, Per Tai has no choice but to heed Move Forward's threat to become the opposition, so says this article from Nation Thailand. And core Per Tai members, including the deputy leader, have conceded that the House Speaker's post should be held by the party that has the largest number of MPs. However, some groups of Per Tai MPs from the North East are fighting this and demanding that the Speaker's post should belong to their party. And from thebangkokpost.com, no let up in Speaker stalemate. And Per Tai MPs reiterated at their latest meeting that the next House Speaker must be a candidate from their party and said the demand would be relayed to the Move Forward Party during their talks today. And this will also reportedly be among the key issues raised at a planned meeting of the eight prospective coalition parties tomorrow. And Per Tai executives and MPs held separate meetings to discuss the matter yesterday. So some really important meetings over the next few days that are going to form the backbone of what's going to happen in the middle of July when the parliament eventually sits down. More of this article and party leader Cholnan says a team of negotiators held talks with the Move Forward Party and proposed that the two parties get 14 cabinet seats each with the MFP entitled to the Prime Minister's position and Per Tai taking the House Speaker role. According to the Bangkok Post, the Move Forward Party accepted the proposal for consideration but has yet to give a definitive answer. So these two parties have been elected by the people of Thailand to lead the next government. They really need to solve this and show that they can negotiate, come to an agreement and then stick to it. You're watching TNT. bit of aviation news now this from bangkok one dot news this is uh, one of the new aggregators in the new business here in thailand and my airline to start bangkok flights the newest low-cost airline in malaysia my airline will launch its first international flights today to bangkok and the chief executive says we're the first malaysian airline to really run flights between two bangkok airports well, no, Air Asia have flown to both Dong Lang and to uh, Suwanapum, 
Uh, so I'm not sure why he's making that particular statement. And he claims an average load factor of 91%. And in addition to planning to travel to other regions of Thailand, including Phuket, Krabi and Chiang Mai, MY Airline also intends to fly to Vietnam, Singapore and Indonesia, primarily to Bali and Jakarta. Well, the more airlines, the merrier. It's good choice for us. It probably helps keep the prices down for at least uh, domestic flights or these close regional flights within an hour or so of Thailand. And I do note over the past uh, couple of months, the prices, say, between Phuket and Bangkok have come down a lot. Now you can get to Bangkok easily for 1,000 or 1,200 baht. Whereas three or four months ago, at the start of the year, you were paying up to four or five thousand baht for that particular trip. And out of all the places I would be thinking about travelling to in the next couple of years, one is definitely off my list, but apparently on other people's lists. That's Myanmar. We go to this story in patiamail.com. Myanmar foreign tourist numbers picking up again. And after the tourist slump caused by the coronavirus pandemic and the February 2021 military coup, yeah, that would sort of be putting me off, international arrivals in Myanmar are showing big increases. In the fiscal year from 2022 to 2023, March to March, 367,000 tourists, mostly with tourist visas, entered the country, an increase of 187% over the previous year. Well, noting that there's still pretty much open civil war there in Myanmar, and uh, the previous year was probably at the height of the conflicts, but those conflicts continue. And a junta spokeswoman said that 13.1%, or around 48,000 of the arrivals, were Chinese nationals, but an encouraging feature was the growth in numbers from India, Russia and the Middle East. Travel agents say that Europeans, Americans and Japanese have mostly kept away on the advice of their governments as parts of the country are gripped by civil war and a lack of human rights. And prior to the pandemic, Myanmar enjoyed 4 million plus tourists a year. They were mostly Australian and European culture vultures in small groups. And then it says the common Western view is that foreigners should avoid visiting Myanmar to deprive the military junta of funds. In the same way that I'm unlikely to travel two miles under the water to have a look at the uh, wreck of the Titanic, I wouldn't be going to Myanmar for much the same reason. It's probably just not safe to do so at the moment. But uh, the patiamail.com reporting that people are flocking back to Myanmar, certainly a place I look forward to visiting again, but only when I consider it's safe to do so. That's it for today's quick whip around some of the news here in Thailand and beyond. As I mentioned, there's a link in the description to that Channel News Asia article if you'd like to read that opinion further. But for now, please subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.